Hello, I'm Lynn Youngbar. I'm the moderator of the panel on um, for the for the um, people taping this, protecting the watershed, and um, I'm just going to quickly give you an intro to our speakers. Uh, their their more detailed bios is on the web are on the website, so you can look them up if you want to know their more about their. Um, uh, prodigious careers, but uh, Celeste Matsukano, that's Celeste. Um, uh, she's a PhD and she's the Aquatic Conservation Program Director at the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Cons Conservation and the Project Coordinator of the International Migratory Dragonfly Partnership, which I can hardly wait to hear about, um, and many other things to her credit. Next is Lisa Arkin who is currently the executive director of Beyond Toxics. She's been there since 2006. And prior to that, she had a long career in higher ed at uh, Stanford and University of Oregon. And uh, I, I believe she's gonna talk about the um, first in-depth analysis of herbicide use in Oregon's industrial forestry practices, right? So that's exciting to me too. Um, Boyce, who I assume will show up, Boyce Thorne Miller is a science policy advisor for the Northwest Atlantic Marine um, Alliance. Um, and she's worked since 1988 as a marine scientist and advisor for several US and international NGOs um, covering ocean environmental issues, including toxic pollution, biodiversity, aquaculture, and fisheries. And then last but not least is Mary M. McAllister who's here from San Francisco Bay Area. She's a citizen activist. For the past 15 years, she's been trying to save the urban forest in the Bay Area from being needless de needlessly destroyed. So I'm thrilled about all our panelists. I'm gonna let them get started. They each have up to 15 minutes and I will be the timekeeper. And, um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. Okay, so Celeste, you're on. Don't start timing me until I hit the slideshow part. I promise. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today uh, very briefly about something that is in roughly like a 120 page report. The, the good news is that there are copies of the report here, along with our new How to Help Your Community Create an Effective Mosquito Management Plan. So feel free to take one or more of those, because I don't need to go home with those on TriMet. And then I think also uh, in your packets for the conference, you had, this is a four page summary, um, basically, of this larger report, this distillation. And these are all available on the, on the Xerces website as well. So I've already had one person um, today say, <laughs> you have an aquatic program at Xerces? We do more than pollinators, actually. And I'm not bitter about the fact that no one knows that we have an aquatic <laughs> program. But you'll notice there's not a single hymenopteran up there. Um, not that they're not important, but uh, I head up the aquatic conservation program. And so this is, this is uh, one of the issues we've been working on a lot in the last couple of years is this ecologically sound mosquito management, um, especially in urban and urbanizing wetlands. And um, one of the things we're trying to do is we realize that a lot of, um, a lot of land Owners, a lot of people that work for natural resource agencies from federal all the way through county and city, they, they don't know the questions to ask um, when it comes to trying to develop their own site-specific plans for mosquito management. And they may receive misinformation that's either deliberate or accidental. Um, and they don't really, they don't know. They don't have the background that they need to be able to say, no, this is what I need for my site. And so that was a large part of what was in our report was trying to give people, you know, here's the background, here are the guidelines, here are the questions to ask, here are the things to think about when you want to think about mosquito management and integrated pest management. So uh, it's no uh, secret, I mean, obviously we've come a long way when it comes to mosquito management. We're no longer dumping diesel oil on top of wetlands. They're not being drained and ditched. Um, people aren't dumping Paris green on wetlands. Acetoarsenate, as this World War II era poster shows, curses it's plain to see malaria. Mosquitoes will never be because of toxic heavy metals. Um, there are, of course, still gambusia, the so-called mosquito fish. These were used all the way back around at the turn of the, the 20th century. In fact, they've been used for a long time. They're native to the southeastern United States, 
but right now they're considered to be the most widely distributed species of fish in the world because people have passed them around, um, and they've had a terrible effect on a lot of native ecosystems. And of course, we've gone through several different iterations and families of chemical uh, mosquito sides, which have had differing effects on the environment. I'm not going to go into any detail through the chemicals that are being used today, but this is a list of the, the most common currently used. Um, of course, organophosphates, pyrethrins, and pyrethroids, these are neurotoxins, these are broad spectrum, they have an effect on a lot of different organisms, not just invertebrates, as I'm sure you know. Oils and films, barrier treatments, these are also very broad spectrum. Uh, we've got the biological, uh, whether that's bacterial toxins from Bacillus thuringiensis, Bacillus sphericus. Growth regulators, um, fungi, uh, and various different natural enemies, some of which are native and some of which are non-native. Again, people tend to think of the biorationals, as they're called, as you know, they're targeted, they're safe. That's true to a certain extent. They're certainly much more targeted than previous types of chemicals that were used, but they still have very broad spectrum. If you use something that affects you know, the growth hormone system of a mosquito, mosquitoes are insects. It's going to affect the growth hormones of any other insect or invertebrate that's in the system. So if you're talking about mosquito management, if pesticides are going to be used as part of an integrated pest management plan, the question always comes up from people, what's the best pesticide to use? What's the safest pesticide? And of course, the answer is there is no one best pesticide. Whatever's going to be the most effective, the most targeted, the best for the particular habitat is going to depend on a lot of different things, all the way from the mosquitoes, the climate, the time of year, what's the particular aspects of your site, um, and of course, the presence and prevalence of mosquito-borne pathogens, because whenever we talk about mosquitoes now, especially with global climate change leading to a lot of changes in range in many different mosquitoes, people are more and more scared about mosquito-borne disease. In some cases, rightly so, when in some cases it's kind of a sky is falling and everybody runs screaming when there's really not that much need for concern. And you got to know whether it's time to run screaming or whether it's time to say, no, we're, we're doing okay here. So what are some of the different challenges that you face in developing integrated pest management for mosquitoes? Well, you know, there's, there's IPM and there's IPM, and it's really easy to say, oh, no, we have a great IPM plan, and certainly some vector control agencies do, and certainly some vector control agencies don't. So this is just kind of up here. Um, the lower statement, this is a quote from the American Mosquito Control Association's best management practices for integrated pest management of mosquitoes, and the top is the Centers for Disease Control. So the CDC is saying, no, you really need to control the larvae. You've got to do source reduction. That's the only cost-effective way and the most overall effective way to control mosquitoes. And you have the AMCA and what are considered to be their best practices saying, you know, adulticiding is really important. And gosh, if you don't have a lot of other resources, just spray adulticides all over because that works really well. So there's this, you know, kind of institutional thinking challenge. And then, of course, there's public attitudes. So we have people that are building their homes a lot more close to natural areas or to wetlands. We're simply spreading out into more habitats. And a lot of housing developments are built with decorative wetlands or lakes or ponds that may or may not be designed to be really good habitat for mosquitoes. I've already talked about this heightened and very often unfounded fear of disease. People don't really even understand what a wetland is. And some people just automatically think a wetland is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And that's very often not the case. And there's also the fact that no matter what, you can tell people what to do, they can know what they need to do, and they're just plain not going to do it. You know, they're not going to empty out that, that abandoned swimming pool. They're not going to spray whatever kind of repellent they decide to use. Um, and this is going to vary depending on age and demographics and lots of different things. So, you know, obviously, of course, getting the public to be more involved in their own protection is a, is a, big, a big issue. So, these are kind of the most important elements, and these are discussed in a great amount of detail in, in our report, and I don't have time to talk about them too much here, but public, in, public engagement and public education is extremely important in mosquito IPM. You've got to know what the local mosquito control methods are, and in many cases, vector control can be extremely reluctant to give you any information, even what their larval monitoring counts are, what species they're looking at, or whether there is any disease present. It can be really you know, beating your head against a wall to try to get that information. Monitor, 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 surveillance beforehand, surveillance after treatment to determine efficacy. Mapping, not everybody has access to really good GIS layers. They don't have access to good mapping programs. You might need a lot of partners to be able to give you this information, but looking at a lot of the different uh, aspects of the habitat and disease prevalence and where people live and densities of, of people and mosquitoes and larvae and adults, um, the monitoring and the mapping can really help you target and uh, create a very pinpointed uh, integrated pest management plan. You need a lot of different partnerships, though, because you're not necessarily going to have all those skills yourselves. And as a lot of the natural agency people that I've worked with just in the last year or two in Portland and the Portland area have found out, it's really great if everybody can be giving the same message to vector control. 
do things differently. This is how we all want you to do things at our sites. Yes, our sites are all different, but this isn't just one squeaky wheel over here. This is everybody saying, here is what you will do at our sites. So developing a site-specific plan, obviously, is very important. You've got to have, obviously, a lot of site-specific knowledge. It takes more time. It takes more effort. You need to know how the site changes and how the mosquitoes at the site change over time. You also need to be a little bit more familiar with mosquitoes. And um, you know, my, my PhD is in entomology, and I'm an increasingly lonely breed because there really aren't that many entomologists out there. And I was kind of assumed, well, yeah, you know, if you're thinking about mosquitoes, you must, you must kind of know about mosquitoes, right? But not, not really, you know, not even to the point of knowing which, you know, which ones you know, breathe and eat at the surface, which ones stick their little tails into plants, and they never come to the surface. They get their oxygen from plant stems, and that makes a big difference in how you control them. So, Knowing what the, the life history of the different species in your area uh, are and, and how that makes them more or less vulnerable to different types of control and whether they even want to bite human beings. You know, a lot of vector control agencies say, oh yeah, we, have a, we use IPM because we have a threshold. We have to reach a threshold of larvae before we, before we treat and it's one larva, <laughs> one larva per dip. So it's basically a no tolerance. Well, maybe that's a species of mosquito that really only likes to bite birds. And there are an awful lot of mosquitoes out there that really only like to bite birds. So you need a lot more than just, yes, there are mosquitoes present in the habitat. Conservation biocontrol. If you do a study of all the wetlands in an area, you will find that some of them produce a lot of mosquitoes. Some of them might produce some mosquitoes every now and then. And some of them produce no mosquitoes at all in any nuisance numbers. And the reason for that is, if you've got a healthy wetland, you've got diverse communities illustrated here by this meadowhawk chomping down on an adult mosquito and that predaceous diving beetle larva that's grabbed a mosquito pupa by the tail, they're not specific predators of mosquitoes. Well, guess what? Neither are the Gambusia mosquito fish. But these creatures are very mobile. They can colonize new habitats quickly. They stay where there is food. And because they don't only feed on mosquitoes, when there's other things for them in the habitat to eat, they'll stick around. So if you've got a healthy wetland, a lot of the reason that you might not ever think about, oh, well, we never had problems with mosquitoes there before is because you've got salamanders and birds and dragonflies and beetles that are busy eating these things and keeping the populations under control because they're also, as much as they may be a nuisance, mosquitoes are also a really important part of wetland ecology and they're very important as a food source for a lot of different critters. So you've got to have all these different questions that you ask um, when you think about creating your site-specific plan. And, you know, again, <laughs> You don't just obviously look at pesticides, but what can we do? What is our, what's the site like? What are the mosquitoes like? Where do they like to breed? Does my monitoring tell me that, yes, there are mosquitoes coming out of this 30, 60, 80, 500 acres of wetlands, but they're not being produced at the exact same level in different places. There's probably little clusters of vegetation or edges or areas where you've got a lot more mosquito production going on, hot spots. Well, if you need to treat, well, you can, you can do targeted spot treatment instead of just sending out the helicopters and spraying the living daylights out of those 300 acres. And you don't need to do it every week either, right? Take a look at what the populations are. When are we looking at an issue? And does disease enter into this at all? So um, all of these are pretty much the same kinds of questions that you would ask anyway. And in addition, you also have to think about, um, are there any species that are either listed under the Endangered Species Act or any state rare or threatened species. And in many cases in this area, there have been times when the Eagle Act has been brought into play. When they say you can't, you can't bring your helicopters over to spray pesticides, you've got bald eagles that are nesting on that island and this would constitute an unlawful disturbance of them. Um, the other thing to think about is when are different life stages in the area particularly sensitive to pesticide application. One of the things that people bring up, they talk about the biological pesticides and a lot of times people like to say BTI, it only kills mosquitoes. Well, it doesn't only kill mosquitoes. It kills the lower diptera, related groups. And those lower diptera are a huge part of wetland biomass, and many creatures really depend on them, especially, for example, migrating birds. You know, there are birds that have stopped using wetlands as migrating stopovers because things like carp invasions have done away with all the invertebrates. There's no food there for them to eat. They've changed the way they, they use the resource. Um, young ducklings, young hatchlings for the first several, several days of their lives, invertebrates are a really, really important part of their food source. So you could say, well, yeah, you know, we do the treatment with BT or whatever, and those populations are knocked down for two weeks, but they, they come back because these things have fast life cycles. Well, that's great, except that if a food desert is suddenly occurring when you've got a bunch of migrant birds that need food, or you've got a bunch of baby ducks that need food, or swallow, or red-winged blackbirds, or whatever it might be. 
A lot of times, too, when it comes to adult deciding, people like to say, well, we use those, those ultra-low volume sprays, the little tiny aerosolized droplets. They've got to contact the mosquito to kill it. They're safe. We don't need to worry about it. No, don't get upset about honeybees. Honeybees are in their hives at night. Well, honeybees are not, amazingly enough, the only bees in North America. Um, they're not the only creatures that are out there. So dragonflies and damselflies, they, they don't go home for the evening. They perch in trees and vegetation where they will be exposed to these materials. A lot of caterpillars can come out very early in the morning to start feeding on their host plants. And especially in the Florida Keys, there are at least four different species of butterfly, one of which is probably functionally extinct really by now. And their population declines are pretty clearly linked to the institution of adulticide spraying for mosquitoes. Bumblebees sleep in flowers at night. They don't go home necessarily to a hive. Squash bees sleep at the base of the plants that they, uh, that they pollinate. And of course, toxicity and impact studies focus on the honeybee. It's the only bee most people think of. But they don't think of all the different native bee species that have different foraging behaviors, habitats, body sizes, and sensitivities. So again, that's another one of those blanket statements that people kind of need the, the knowledge to be able to contradict. Another you know, statement that's made is like, well, there's, there's no effect on non-target organisms. And that's very easy to say when you don't go out and look at them. And most people, when it comes to invertebrates, have no idea what the invertebrate population of the biodiversity or community is like at a site. They never looked at it. They probably don't have the, the skills, the capacity in-house to do it. If you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. So basically, um, this idea of mosquito management, and this is, as I said, this is coming up more and more. You know, I've seen West Nile virus, right? Now, it's very true that certain counties and certain states have had really bad episodes of West Nile virus in the last couple of years, some where they had never done adult deciding. They said, you know, we're going to have to do adult deciding in a limited way, knock down the population of infective mosquitoes. But that's one of those things that the media just has to bring it up and everybody's scared because nobody wants their, their family, their kids, their loved ones themselves to get West Nile virus. But, you know, that can be used as a scare tactic in a county, for example, that is in a state that had six cases total last year of West Nile virus is what we had in, in Oregon, six cases. Um, and in a county where nobody had a case in a couple of years, but you say West Nile virus, even when it's a species of mosquito that is not known to be an epidemiological vector of West Nile, and it doesn't matter, you've raised that fear factor. So people need to know where to find the real information about well, how much of a problem is West Nile virus in my county and how do I, how do I find that out? Um, so that's, that's one of the things. Um, so, I mean, wise use of wetlands. So you need to think about how do we protect the people? How do we protect the habitat? And realize that wetlands, natural wetlands, oftentimes don't produce mosquitoes at all. And constructed wetlands, such as stormwater retention and detention wetlands, there are very clear guidelines for how to construct them specifically so that they are not mosquito producing ponds, basically. So this, this information is out there and people just need to know how to get it. You know, this is going to lower costs overall because you're not going to have as many pesticide applications. You can balance, you know, balancing risks and risks and, and dangers. You can balance the wetland biodiversity against the real view of what are the human health needs, the human health issues. And of course, that becomes difficult in a place like, I've lived in Louisiana, I've worked in mangrove swamps, I've been up in the wetlands in Saskatchewan, and I hear people in Portland complain about mosquito bites. That means literally they had two mosquito bites. So of course the, the tolerance in different places is gonna be so very different to you know, the nuisance biting. So balancing the needs of the environment with the needs of the community, that can take a lot of work uh, at times. Um, but you, know, you can effectively accomplish mosquito control, and mosquito management when needed <coughs> with minimal to no pesticides, with no adulticides, even in many cases where there is the presence of mosquito-borne disease. It takes more work, it takes more knowledge, it takes more partners, but there is, sorry to have to say this, unfortunately, no magic bullet. But I think this is an issue that, as I said, with increasing range changes, non-native species of mosquitoes spreading, um, species that can vector nasty, very nasty tropical diseases, this is background information that everybody is going to need a lot more of, or they're just going to be reverting back to, you know what, let's drain all those wetlands, because they just produce mosquitoes. And I think I made it in time. Yep, you did. Sweet. Thank you. Okay.
Um, All right. So um, Lisa Arkin from Beyond Toxics uh, discussing forestry uses of herbicides. Uh, if, if you're, especially if you're not from Oregon or haven't been reading the media lately, uh, you may not be aware that Oregon does a lot of helicopter spraying over large tracts of forest lands. And they're not only forest lands, they're rural residential communities, they're streams, they're water systems, they're towns in these same areas. We did a case study, let's see if I can, hey, um, using data that was gathered for a health study done for a small community in Western Lane County called Triangle Lake. And briefly, because there's, you know, I could talk about that for 15 minutes alone. Briefly, um, folks were reporting illnesses following aerial helicopter applications of herbicides. And it got to the point where um, they had urine samples done. There was findings of 2,4-D and atrazine. And, the samples and which launched sort of a investigation that was partnered by EPA and our Oregon state agencies. Once those pesticide records were obtained because of the involvement of federal agencies, Beyond Toxics was able to get those records. This is very significant because forestry data had never been analyzed for any kind of data before because it was Basically, it's against the law in Oregon to ask for the records, much less get the records. So it took this investigation for us to get a hold of three years worth of data. Only three years worth, so we can't make a lot of projections about what the trends we see in this data. We see definite trends, but with only three years worth of data, it's, it's a little difficult. Other states collect and save seven years worth of data. Washington State, for example. So if we had a law that allowed us to access seven years' worth of data, we would be able to make more definitive statements. So the study area was relatively small. It's about 180,000 acres in an area about 12 miles west of Eugene. And that uh, poly, polygon shape you see, just kind of remember that that's the study area. And you'll see that shape kind of beneath some of the maps. We looked at the data, we analyzed it uh, for pounds of pesticides, ounces, gallons, every which way. We converted everything into pounds, and then we mapped all of the spray application records with using GIS mapping. Um, this is, again, there's that polygon in the background. You can see here, uh, although it might be hard for you to read it, the purple area is the rural residential area. So that's where the homes are. The, Green area is either is federal forest, either BLM or US Forest Service. The yellowish area are private forest lands, and the gray is state forest lands. It's about 48% private, about 48% uh, federal, and the rest is either rural, residential, or state forest. So that's the lay of the land. Also, what you've seen here is the checkerboard pattern of the ONC lands. And if you're not from Oregon, you may not know what that means. But it's a checkerboard of federal-owned and state-owned forest lands. The little triangle in the middle blue is Triangle Lake. This is what the stream uh, pattern looks like in Oregon's coastal mountains. It's a web of life. And this data was obtained from the uh, Oregon Spatial Data Map Library. So you can see that when you spray herbicides from a helicopter over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of land, you cannot avoid impacting the water system. And we'll get into more about why. This is what a typical clear cut looks like. Steep slopes, although this is not even as steep as some. And then you see the logging road in the foreground. So you've got the runoff from the hill there. You also have pesticides, or in this case herbicides, sprayed on the logging road two to three to four times a year, all of that running off. And if you, know, if you could perch yourself over the road, you'd see the stream there at the bottom of the clear cut. So that's a runoff issue. So let's look at some of the data. Um, when we analyzed the data, remember we converted everything into pounds very carefully. 
we found that in the three years of data, 2009, 2010, 2011, there was a 99% increase in ground and helicopter sprays, increase in pounds of product. Actually, yeah, product, because a product includes, includes active and inert ingredients. We also broke it down by season. We found definite differences in what is applied in the spring season and the fall season. So when you look to your left, that's the spring, and the three columns to your right are, are fall sprays. And then we broke it down by what, what types of herbicides were sprayed. So the red is 2,4-D, the yellow is atrazine, the, um, um, kind of a greenish color is glyphosate, and the bluish color is hexazinon, and then there are other ingredients. But what we learned is the, the universe of herbicides typically used on forest land, and this had not been known before. We, didn't, we, we had inklings of what was sprayed, but we didn't actually know what was being sprayed. Um, and you can see then in the spring of 2011, that huge spike in pounds of herbicide applied. That was the year that people in the Triangle Lake complained so bitterly about being sick, and that was the year the first urine analysis was done. So you can see, first of all, why people complain. Of course, they were told at the time they were crazy before we had this data. They were simply told they were imagining these things and were just anti-timber. Secondly, what was found in the urine was atrazine and 2,4-D in each person, and you can see why. These were aerial sprays. Um, as you can see, this is just the aerial spray. We didn't do this for the ground spray because of certain problems with the way the data is recorded. We also learned that these herbicides are delivered in tank mixes. So a helicopter doesn't just load up with 2,4-D and deliver that to the environment. The helicopter loads up with 2,4-D plus atrazine plus hexazinone and an adjuvant and a carrier, which could be crop oil. Uh, so these are real tank mixes that we were able to discern from the actual spray record that's kept by the spray operator or applicator. Uh, the second one, get a load of this, 2,4-D plus triclopyr plus sulfuron, sulfuron, I can't even, sulfuron methyron methyl plus metsulfuron methyl plus amazepur in crop oil. Um, and why? Just tell me why. Why are they doing this? I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, but, what, just to, to get if you, everything on a clear cut? Is that it's Oh, oh, the real why. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The re what they say, the, what they say is that they uh, need to get rid of all types of competing vegetation from grasses to pin oak to Oregon's, um, what's our, our state plant, the Oregon grape. They spray a lot of Oregon grape, our state plant, uh, blackberry, and competing hardwood trees such as alder, maple, madrone, and cedar. Why? You, I, you, why? <laughs> because fur is a cash crop. This is not forest. This is fur farming. Yeah, and, and we could go on. That's why when they said, how long do you want to take? I said, yeah, it'll take forever. There's a lot to say about this issue. OK. Does anyone ever do a study about the environmental impacts of these herbicides? No, they do not. Uh, we can't get any studies done in Oregon, so we did our own study, and we took a, um, a formula that is used by Cornell University and developed by, I see some, I know it's outdated, but hey, what, what tools do we have? Yes. Yeah, there are better ones, but um, we use this one because at least we could get the formula and input the data into it, and we didn't have to hire a consultant. <laughs> so, but it's it's an indication of the environmental impact, which also does take into account things like s impacts of soil quality, quality, water quality, 
invertebrates, and human health. It's kind of a formula that mixed together, um, developed by Dr. Kovach, Joseph Kovach. So, in 2009, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know, about 13 sprays in the spring and a few more in the fall. But you can see which chemicals are the most environmentally hazardous. So the red again is 2,4-D, and the yellow again is atrazine. So this is, I spoke with Dr. Kovach and assured, got assurance that the way we were doing this was appropriate. You can, in a sense, add them up because they are in one tank mix and their hazards, in a sense, combine. However, we really don't know the synergistic impacts of these chemicals. So this is just very basic first attempt to do this, and I always have to remind people we're just a nonprofit. We're not a research institute. We're doing the best we can, but you see different impacts in spring sprays and fall sprays, and also we have the um, landowner below, so you can tell who's doing the most harmful practices and who is least harmful. So that taught us that there are choices in how you manage your land. Here's 2010, I'm gonna whip through this. You can see 2,4-D and atrazine increased and those environmental impact quotients go up. And then in 2011, there's something like 23 sprays in the spring and that's again when people were just saying it was a relentless onslaught. Um, so we've, you know, if you've heard about atrazine in this conference and previous years, we all know it's an endocrine disruptor, but it's also a persistent groundwater pollutant. So we're here to talk about water. Uh, it's banned in the European Union. But interestingly enough, unlike Oregon, where it's sprayed liberally over all those streams you saw, and we'll talk about buffer zones in a minute, it's banned near any kind of protected groundwater source in the state of Washington. So there are some controls there, and we'll talk more about that. Let's talk about salmon steelhead streams. So in Oregon, uh, Coho salmon is a threatened species, and steelhead is a species of concern, as well as other salmonoids. And in this, there's that poly polygon again in the background of the study area, and you can see the blue are the recognized ESA streams, endangered species streams there, and the checkerboard in the background. So when we looked at one, for the purposes of today, because I'm rushing, we looked at one small uh, fish habitat, which is a unique core cold water salmon habitat. R hard to find these. And what we found is the bright green lines are the salmon habitat streams. The orange is where the company said they sprayed. Uh, and you can see that they're spraying right over these uh, headwaters and tributaries to the main stem stream. Now, the main stem stream has a buffer zone. And here it is. But the, head, the headwaters do not have the buffer zone. And the purple is where we mapped an imaginary 300-foot buffer, which had been required by court order to protect salmon streams. But we can see they probably did not respect that buffer. We also found that there were distinct areas where most likely 2,4-D was also sprayed directly into the stream channel, the red marks over the kind of salmon colored. Salmon is where they spray the 2,4-D and the red is where it's right over a stream. We also did water quality sampling and I'll go through this quickly. We did find hexazinone and metabolites of atrazine in salmon streams and we were able to prove it only could be from drift and I'm going to that. So this is a problem in the spring. You got all this runoff from the hillsides and it's going right into people's water systems. Um, and we know that synergistic effects for fish are something of great concern, although we don't have a lot of data on it, but here's a quote from Noah. Um, okay, what about these buffers real briefly? Oregon allows all non-fish streams to be sprayed directly, even ones that flow into ESA-listed streams. There's no buffer zone in Oregon. However, in Washington and Idaho, there are no spray buffer zones for all surface water. This is a huge difference. To say it in a nutshell, Oregon is not protecting its surface water for in forestry operations. I'm not speaking about ag. We don't protect our groundwater either. 
there's no particular provision to protect groundwater. And we talked about there's bans and, and all sorts of reviews that you have to go through in Washington to, to assess what to do to protect a groundwater source. So the biggest spray buffer in Oregon for a fish stream is 60 feet. That's it for aerial spray. We're not talking ground spray. A helicopter, that's, you know, could be 100 feet, 200 feet in the air. All right, and uh, because I don't have time, we did a huge analysis of the various P Forest Practices Acts between Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, and again, let's just look at the first row, domestic water supply. In Washington, you need a 200-foot buffer plus a very extensive review that is uh, application process. In Oregon, there's a 60-foot buffer, because it's all waters at the, that have a fish or for drinking have 60 feet, no review by the agency, no public comment, plus we're not allowed to know what they're spraying, when they're spraying, and for what they're spraying. I don't have time to go through the rest of the chart, sorry. All right, but let's take one example. We looked at Triangle Lake School. So you remember the little Triangle Lake? Right near it is the Triangle Lake School, which is a K through 12 rural school. So there's how it looked in 2007 when I was there for a community meeting and took this picture. Here's how it looked in 2008. The uh, warehouser did a huge clear cut all around the school, all the way down to the classrooms. And again, there's more detail here, but we don't have time. Now, we forget, those of us who live in the city, that we get our water delivered through a pipe by a municipal water system. This school, like all rural schools, has a well. Where's the well? At the bottom of that hill. So we mapped it. Um, now, we can't say for sure they sprayed near the well because we're not allowed to know. We do know they sprayed the hillside, and we do know what they sprayed. And it, they sprayed a Mazapir, which is persistent in water, and the USDA did a well water study of a number of schools throughout the United States in 2012. You might have read about that. What did they find in the Triangle Lake School well water? Imazapur. So um, the yellow is the um, clear cut, where they did the clear cut. Um, the blue circle is we just buffered, we took where the well was and then buffered it out uh, 150 feet. And as you can see, there's an overlap there where they could have sprayed within 150 feet of the well. We don't know. We're just saying that since no one keeps records and they did find a mazapir in the well, uh, yeah. So uh, we found, to just summarize our data, we found a 56% increase in the acres of forest land sprayed in this one study area within three years. So they increased it by 56%. We found a 99% increase in the pounds sprayed, aerial spray, again, we're not talking ground spray. And between spring of 2009 and spring of 2011, there was a 226% increase in aerial sprays. There's nothing in our laws to prevent any of this. There's nothing in our laws to monitor any of this. And there's nothing in our law to even require study of this. Um, and I won't go into human health because it's not really the purpose of this panel. But we have these questions about, you know, what are we doing by spraying 2,4-D and atrazine in these watersheds? Um, and we have certain recommendations, and we just want to remind everyone that in federal forests, there is no aerial spray. Thank you.
Yeah, I, I'm from California, and uh, I don't think I have fully appreciated <laughs> that our laws are, in fact, a little better than yours. And even though I, I agree with Fritzi that a law doesn't get you all the way there, it does give you a tool. So it's a good place to start. Okay, do I look okay? Okay. If you folks are worried about pesticides, I s what? I'm sorry? No, no. I think I am, aren't I? Okay. I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay. Um, if you folks are concerned about pesticides, which is, I assume, why you're, we're all here today, you should also be concerned about ecological restorations. Uh, I, I have only have time for a few examples today, so I invite you to visit this website, milliontrees.me, to see descriptions of many similar projects all over the country and all over the world. Okay, how do you go on? Cursor? There we go. The California Invasive Plant Council is a nonprofit organization that's in the business of designating non native plants and trees as invasive, which makes them targets for eradication. There are uh, about 200 plants and trees on this list of invasive species in California. There are similar organizations in most states and a federal committee which has two members who are employees of companies that manufacture pesticides. Um, the California Invasive Plant Council recently conducted a survey of land managers, public, private, land trusts, they ask them what methods they're using to control plants they consider invasive. And this is what they learned. Ninety-four percent of the land managers said that they used herbicides in addition to other methods to control invasive plants. Ten percent said they always use herbicides. 62% said they used herbicides frequently. And these are the herbicides that they used. Virtually all land managers use glyphosate project, products such as Roundup. 74% use uh, Garlon with the active ingredient triclopyre. Triclopyre is rated as toxic to aquatic life and moderately toxic to adult bees by the EPA. One study found that triclopyre can significantly reduce the reproductive success of birds. Garlon is considered one of the most hazardous herbicides on the market by risk assessments. Now this is a project in the Central Valley of California that is typical of these projects, and it demonstrates how futile they often are. The California Department of Transportation gave researchers at UC Davis $450,000 to restore two acres of non-native annual grasses to native grasses. They used every method they could think of. They started by spraying herbicides and broadcast seeding native plants. Then they burned the annual grasses. They also mowed and plowed and plug planted natives. After eight years, they ran out of ideas and money, more importantly, threw up their hands and declared victory. Victory was defined as 50% native plants, which they expected to persist for 10 years. This is a park, one of 32 parks in San Francisco that was designated as a natural area over 15 years ago. 
which means that native, non-native plants are being eradicated and replaced with native plants. It's the only municipal park in San Francisco that has a creek running through it. At the bottom of this slope, there's a creek. And beside that creek is a child care center that operates year round. This is a field of non-native oxalis, a favorite weed of beads. Oxalis in this park had been sprayed for three consecutive years with garlon before this picture was taken. This park, 70 acre park, has been sprayed at least 10 times a year for the last five years. And the watershed into that park, Twin Peaks, has been sprayed more often. This is the public record of uh, herbicide use by the so-called Natural Areas Program, the outfit that's responsible for managing these so-called natural areas. Uh, so this is an example of something that we do have access to, and, and it is an advantage. We, uh, the public record exists for only six years, but they have been using herbicides continuously for 15 years. As you can see, their herbicide use just keeps increasing, and this program is using more toxic herbicides than other city departments are permitted to use, such as Garlon. Now, pesticides are also used to kill animals based on the belief that killing one animal will benefit another. I'm going to tell you about a project that plans to aerial bomb 1.3 metric tons of rodenticides on a national wildlife refuge to kill mice. Now, some of what I'm going to say about this project might be a little hard to believe, so I suggest that you visit milliontrees.me to see uh, the details, including links to the environmental impact statement for this project. Um, the reason why the mice are being killed is because U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service believes that um, Oh, stepping back, sorry. The mice are the preferred prey of an average population of six burrowing owls that visit the Farallon Islands briefly. The Farallon Islands are 27 miles off the coast of San Francisco. They're the home of millions of seabirds, many of them rare and a huge population of marine mammals. So Fish and Wildlife actually believes, or at least they claim to believe, that if they kill all the mice, the burrowing owls will quit visiting the Farallons. And the reason why they want them to quit visiting the Farallons is that they also claim that if the burrowing owls run out of mice, they eat the chicks and eggs of the ashy storm petrel. So the ultimate beneficiary of this project is supposed to be the ashy storm petrel. Now both the burrowing owl and the ashy storm petrel are rare birds. Both have been designated as species of concern by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. For some reason, in this case, the ashy storm petrel is the preferred bird. Over 27,000 people have signed a petition to U.S. Fish and Wildlife to abandon this horrible plan. It's also worth noting that the same company that was paid nearly a half a million dollars to write the environmental impact statement for this project will also be paid $1.3 million to aerial bomb the Farallon Islands with rodenticides. Some people might consider that a conflict of interest. 
Now, it's necessary to say a little bit about rodenticide so that you can appreciate just how dangerous this project is to the animals that live on this refuge. Rodenticides are anticoagulants, which means the animal bleeds to death. So the target, in this case the mice, eat the rodenticide pellet, but they don't die immediately. They scurry around while they bleed to death which makes them easy prey for owls, raptors, and omnivores such as gulls that eat anything, including dead mice. So these birds become the secondary target of the rodenticides. Two owls died of rodenticide poisoning in one park in one year in San Francisco, the park I showed you earlier with the beautiful field of oxalis, so that gives you some idea of how often this happens. The East Bay Regional Park District used 1,700 pounds of rodenticides in 2009 and 1,000 pounds in 2010. Now, returning to the Farallons. Some of those rodenticides are going to end up in the ocean, and they're going to be eaten by the fish and the fish are the prey of the mammals. So, we kill one animal, leads to killing another animal. You gotta wonder whether or not we're just killing ourselves. So, wrapping up. Enough bad news, let's wrap up. Pesticides are the main tool of ecological restorations. The public is largely unaware of how much pesticide is being used in their public parks. Many of these projects are futile. They're not accomplishing their restoration goal. So there's very little benefit to the risks associated with all this pesticide use. Pesticide use, as we all know, or we wouldn't be here, have unintended and unanticip unanticipated consequences and economic interests are perpetuating the use of pesticides by these projects. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm going to take a little bit different oh. approach on this. Uh, we've had three superb examples <laughs> of how pesticides are used and misused, and many of the important questions um, have been asked by, three, by these three speakers. And what I'd like to do right now is say, okay, what should we be doing um, to not get into the, these kinds of situations? And I'd like to... Uh, propose a very basic framework for making decisions, and then I'd like the audience to please participate in trying to fill in that, uh, that framework. If, or if you don't think it's a good framework, say that too. So um, just very briefly, this is a what I see as a precautionary approach to the management of species and ecosystems that are in transition and they're mostly in transition because of us. Uh, ultimately, it's about the ecosystems and the connections among them. Now, that I loved that slide of the, of the Oregon stream beds because I'm looking at this from the ocean, and what am I seeing? <laughs> I'm seeing all of that coming down those streams into the ocean to affect everything there. And nobody, that's never part of the plan. That's never part of the, uh, the discussion about should we, should we use these pesticides or not. It's not just the ecosystems onto which they are sprayed, but it's also everything they flow into. And that's why the watershed theme is so important. The watersheds are the ultimate connection between land and sea. And we also need to remember that change in systems 
is a natural thing. And the kinds of things that Mary uh, talked about, these, oh, we have to kill all of those species so we can have these species that do the same thing in that ecosystem, does that really make sense? I mean, we are too devoted to the names of these species and not really looking at their function. It's really, we, we want a healthy <coughs> ecosystem that has a full complement of ecosystem functions. And that's what, what should be our goal. So I would, I would hope that in the future, more precautionary decision making could be made. Obviously, a lot of this is, is driven by economic profit. And it's going to be hard to get managers and governments even to get away from that. But we can try. So I'm going to, per I'm going to propose just a sort of a four stage decision making process. Uh, beginning with creating the picture, doing a really good job of assessing what is the ecosystem. If we're, if we're talking about some action going on, proposed action going on in an ecosystem, what does this ecosystem look like? Is it healthy? What did it look like before? Um, is, and are the, are the changes acceptable? And if, n if not, then are there better ways of dealing with those changes than making worse changes by, po by poisoning the system. Um, then this, the, so, that's, so that is creating, and this requires a lot of science and a lot of, it, it will include a lot of, un, of information that we don't have. I mean, we'll have to identify this is things, these are things we don't know about the ecosystem, but at least let's consider everything we do know. And then the second one, and I think it's important that this be second and not first, is what role do humans play in, this, in the ecosystem? And I'm talking about the, what role are they playing in the problem, the perceived problem, if there is one? What role are they playing, what, what are they getting from the ecosystem? Or, and what would they, what, how would they be affected by the possible uh, actions that are being proposed. And what, what part do they play in that ecosystem? We don't tend to describe ecosystems and include people. But really, we are one of the species in the ecosystem. And so we need to assess that better. And then we need to also assess our own motivation. Are we to what extent are we putting the ecosystem first? To what extent are we putting ourselves first? And is, are, we, are we willing to accept both of those? And to what extent are we just reacting the way we're told to react? And I think those are questions that really must be answered by society as we go through these, um, these proposals to do these various kinds of projects. The third uh, step I would like to propose is that a, a sort of a visioning process, what is the goal that we really want to get to as, as members of this ecosystem, as the human members of this ecosystem, what do we think it should look like? Um, and if it's, not, if it's not there now, are there things we can do, things that won't make it worse, non-toxic <coughs> things, are there things that we can and should be doing, and are there things that we should make sure that we don't do? Um, so this is a, a, a really a personal, uh, get, getting all the different you know, people in the ecosystem to, to participate, um, a personal evaluation of where we think this should end up. And finally, the plan. And that plan must be something that citizens participate in in an active way and actually are encouraged to ask questions and are encouraged to demand uh, assessments and answers and monitoring and all the things 
that have been done. I mean, each of these talks uh, before me have, have shown examples of what is being done, what isn't being done, what should be done, and the kinds of, of it, ecosystem factors we should take into account. So I'm going to stop right there, and I hope I'll have some input <laughs> from the rest of you. Um, do, you wanna, do you want people to respond to you right now? Because you have a few minutes left. No, time, so that's part of it. They're, they're part of my few minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> no? Well, yes. I I think it's. I think it is coming. I think there are scientists such as the person in Puerto Rico I referred to, but there are a number of scientists that are now willing to speak up about this and question it. And I think there's some really exciting ideas coming from your field of how to look at <coughs> ecosystems and say, yes, maybe they need to be improved a bit, but we don't necessarily have to go back to the way they were on, you know, June 4th of of 1850. Right. Uh, well, that's one of the interesting yeah. examples that was given to me by a friend was the idea of Scotch Burn, which mm -hmm. most people realize uh, is oh, very yeah. invasive. Invasive, plant. right. <laughs> and yet, if you look at it from a permacultural perspective, uh, it will only colonize certain very disturbed lands, yeah. and it will only stay as long as it is welcome in the way that it needs to be welcome. So it actually doesn't last that long in the landscape if it's left to run its course. Yeah, and that's so we don't that's necessarily have to go stray all the highways. We can just kind of let it do its thing. And that is true of very many of these quote invasive species. They come in, they they shock people, and then they take their place in the ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want you know I I really appreciate what Peggy you were saying, what Troy said, and the only thing is my pessimism about the human species. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> It does require some faith. <laughs> and my struggle on Lower Bay, when I was a part of a committee where we were with the local scientists, and I remember saying, well, don't you think we should look at this grant and see what service it benefit it might be producing? Well, I have to tell you, the screaming and yelling took <laughs> place. Yeah. And then the worst thing was is that they started saying that this grass had been responsible for all sorts of things that it was absolutely not responsible for. And so, I'm, and that was a while ago, you know, but it's, it's really, it's the human species that manipulates <laughs> the truth. You know, if these plants could speak, they'd have a real interesting story. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, how do you, even the first step of yep. creating the yep. picture, mm -hmm. assessing the ecosystem, mm -hmm. how do you create um, the commitment uh, to do that? Well, that, that costs right. money before you actually get down to, you know, asking what the goal is. Right. Um, I can only answer that by giving you one example, and I don't know how easy it has been, but uh, fisheries is in a terrible situation, and part of it is because it has been managed species by species all along, and it has failed and failed and failed every time they've tried a new system. And so the newest thing is ecosystem-based management, and NOAA, at least I can only speak for the Northeast, which I'm most familiar with, the Science Center of NOAA, so this is a government institution, is really promoting ecosystem-based management, and they are doing a lot of the description and the modeling and the, you know, the data gathering that's, that's essential. Now, that requires money, obviously, and it, re and it requires some support from the community uh, 
that they're serving uh, to, to do that. So that's one example. I don't know how, how easy that's going to be. But well, I, uh, one more thing, local too, think local, because sometimes your local peop uh, um, uh, uh, officials are much more w responsive. Yeah. And, you know, this, Still? in my education, was <laughs> oh, excuse me. long ago. But I, yeah. I, I, I think about it um, now with relation to aquatic invertebrate communities and fish. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, because there are many toxic herbicides that are used in Oregon, mm -hmm. after being 2,4-D, yeah. that um, affect aquatic invertebrate communities. Mm -hmm. And I looked at some of the DEQ studies, um, and I'm wondering, do you all know of any studies that study, um, that, that look at the concentration at points downstream, points downstream, yeah. points downstream. Is it true that we're seeing these concentrations get diluted downstream or, <laughs> or not really? That's, um, that's, because we're talking about yeah. bigger watersheds, bigger areas that are sprayed, but we're also talking greater volumes of water. And I'm wondering if there's any basis to this, to this claim that dilution is the solution to pollution. I'm sure it varies by chemical, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. I can actually say something about that as far as kind of unanticipated consequences. There was uh, studies that were done, and of course what you say about the aquatic invertebrates, because one of the great shortcomings of, you know, every, like in mosquito control, the first thing everybody will say is, these are EPA registered pesticides. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying you're digging up DDT from your backyard, dudes. I mean, that's not the point. Yes, of course, they, they're labeled under FIFRA, right. but these, these labels are given based on acute short-term toxicity studies, LC50, 50% 50 of the population, Five that's a lot. Factor. Okay, so what it takes other people though to come along and say, gosh, I wonder what happens to these crabs, these shrimp, these yeah. stoneflies, these whatever, Precisely. when you do long-term exposures to sub lethal concentrations. And what gets more directly yes. to your question is there was a study that was done, I'm forgetting which city it was, it's, it's in, it's in the, the, the full mosquito report there. Um, but they were, they were talking about the fact, they say, oh, you know, pyrethroids, they, they break down very quickly, but they really like to bind the sediment. And they found that during regular applications of all the pyrethroid sprays, that that the, uh, um, the sediment concentrations in the streams in the area were high enough that given the constant applications and the oh, presence yeah. of you know, adjuvants, that the concentrations were at the same level that caused substantial mortality in, in copepods and crustaceans in the lab. So it's not all necessarily <laughs> flowing downstream that, either. Right, and the sediments are really critical right. because there's so many things that depend on those sediments and that has been a problem for long time no a known problem that's the only thing that i only issue i have with unanticipated consequences they're ignored yeah. consequences <laughs> if you don't look for them you won't find them and yeah. and they know <laughs> Yeah, I'm concluded. Your you're, you can so come. Directly really well, yeah. yeah, I think it could be because, I mean, I've, I've listened to the speaker say I appreciate everything that you said. It's yep. refreshing. I think that we're going to public agency, and the question is how do you get this, you know, how do you get this to take traction? And it is by starting small in, in individual community groups and in individual mm -hmm. as yourself to take the interest in it. What I've noticed, and, and I'm like Chip, you know, I've been around forever, and mm -hmm. I've been doing this, but, you know, I started out in the Midwest.
dogs and people and recreation. And yeah, it'd be great if it was like that, but it's not going to be like that. You can't ride a bicycle from one spot to another and not spread seeds. Yeah. And so it's going to happen. So if you could spray out this whole area, and I can guarantee you in six months, you've reinvested it. They've been at it for 15 years. They have almost no success. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, they are not ready to give up. Uh, and public policy makers are still supporting it. Right. Every DOT agency is a great example of that because you go down every road where they try to do this and you go back 10 years and it's back to where it was. Yeah. Great. So did you have a one, any final comments, Voice? Otherwise, I'm going to open it up for questions. And I'm going to take a little bit of the prerogative of the um, moderator and, uh, and let Allison, <laughs> Allison Kenzie, just mentioned a project in Oregon that just got uh, funding last session. Um, so you want to just take a couple minutes and, and mention that, and then I see a question here, and there's some others too. So go. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. Because if you can speak oh, to the microphone, sure. then it can yeah. be on the. On yeah. the Hi, I'm Allison Hensey. I'm with the Oregon Environmental Council. And we've heard a, a lot of really discouraging news today. So I wanted to share one success story. Um, that's a model that was developed here in Oregon that I think has real promise. It's called a Pesticide Stewardship Partnership. And it's a locally based collaborative um, working group that is based on some pretty simple principles and has shown real success in three areas of Oregon so far, in the Hood River Valley, in uh, the Dalles, which is right next door, and in the Walla Walla area. Um, and it's also a model that's being tried in several watersheds in the Willamette Valley as well. Um, and it's based on really simple principles. It's based on um, monitoring for pesticides in water, based on what's being used in the area, um, and then an assessment of whether any of those pesticides are providing um, risks to aquatic life or human health. Um, and then the next step is sharing what's found that is of concern with the local community, with local groups like watershed councils, soil and water conservation districts, and then the pesticide user groups in that area. Uh, and then next, there is a common conversation with uh, technical experts like, in this case, Oregon State University extension agents about what some of the solutions are. What can pesticide users do to prevent these pesticides of concern ending up in water at such significant levels? And then there is um, outreach through the pesticide user group, industry associations, and all of the different organizations that work in that community to tell people what the problem is and that it's impacting things they care about, like salmon and drinking water, and then to talk about the solutions, the best management practices that can help reduce the impacts on water. And then there's continual monitoring so that you can see if those steps actually work. And so in the Hood River Valley, which is the first place that this model was tried about 13 years ago now, um, they were finding chlorpyrifos at levels above water quality standards. Um, pretty consistently. And so a partnership was formed between the Warm Springs tribe and the Columbia Gorge fruit growers, because it's primarily an orchard area, um, and uh, local watershed council, soil and water conservation district, our Department of Environmental Quality, EPA. Uh, and they worked with Oregon State University to develop a whole best management practice guide for the orchard industry that had from the very simple to the more complex best practices. The simplest was probably when you get to two rows from the stream with your spray, turn around and spray the other direction so you're not spraying over the water. You know, that's the really simple one. To uh, you know, a six-year study around using pheromone disruption uh, for coddling moth, where um, at the end of that study, they went from having an incredible number of detections of coddling moth and a lot of pesticide use to, at the end, I think they had one detection that year. Uh, and so it took an incredible partnership and a lot of resources to find solutions. But at the end of the day, they've reduced uh, detections of chlorpyrifos by over 90%, now well below water quality standards. This has been repeated with different pesticides in the Dalles and in the Walla Walla Basin as well. And so we know that it can work. Um, it hasn't worked everywhere it's been tried, uh, especially in more complex <laughs> watersheds where there haven't been the same resources dedicated in terms of technical assistance and collaboration with industry groups. But it's a really promising model. And 
Um, anything that we can find that reduces pesticides by 90% in the water is something that we need to invest more resources in. And in the state of Oregon, um, until last year, um, you know, we've got to start with information. What's actually getting into the water in terms of pesticides? And in the state of Oregon, there was no stable funding source for monitoring for pesticides. Um, just last year, we were able to work with a lot of different groups to pass a budget package so that now, for the first time, there's a million and a half dollars of biennium in Oregon for pesticide monitoring at a watershed level to see what the problem is and then for technical assistance to work with groups to, to help them find solutions to prevent those pesticides from ending up in the water and ongoing monitoring to make sure it's working. Um, so we're really excited about that um, and we actually think we need a lot more money because um, that, that amount alone isn't going to cover the state. Um, but it's, it's a promising model and we're excited to see it happen. Um, I've got some handouts if anybody's interested in more information. Great. Thank you. So there was a question and yes. I, it was a comment, and, and maybe uh, it'll be very unpopular, but I just wanted to react to the, your, your comments about the use of rodenticides uh, on, on the fair lawns. I, I'm not going, to, not going to defend the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or their plans. It did sound a little, little out there. Uh, I just want to point out, though, I mean, there are some examples where um, the use of these products to take rats off from various uh, islands uh, has been absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, th there are some successes out there, is what I'm saying. Uh, rats, you know, as an ecologist, I look at some of these areas, rats can be extremely destructive. I mean, there's some ideas now that Easter Island was actually uh, laid to waste not by overpopulation, but in fact by rats. Um, I've <coughs> seen, I was in New Zealand looking at places, and New Zealand is like a big zoological park with the exception of the places where they have nuked the rats uh, in some places 15, 20 years ago. And it's, it's a veritable paradise with flora and fauna and the indigenous species. You go, wow, this is what that place looked like before they brought the rats in. So I, you know, I don't want to defend the products that are being used. I've worked on these products. I've published on their impacts. <laughs> On, on, on eagles and, and other species. And I know they're very impactful, and I've actually, we've actually said that they shouldn't be used by the public anywhere, anytime. Uh, that's the second, I'm talking about the second uh, generation compounds that are, uh, you know, that they plan to use or they want to use for these island eradication projects. I don't think they have a place in the uh, local, uh, you know, Walmart and that people should be using them full stop. Uh, they, they're not needed. It's the proverbial sledgehammer to where you know, uh, fly swatter would be enough. However, I wouldn't necessarily throw out, throw out the baby with the bathwater completely because there are some shining examples out there where it's, it's made a huge difference to the ecology of some areas. Do you think there would be a better way to do it? You know, a better way to apply it or a safer? In some cases, yeah. I was, I was actually. Some of my students really were doing impact studies on one such project in Canada. We were able to do a lot of the baiting by foot in bait stations to try to reduce the amount of spread in the environment. There were some areas, and you look at some of the topographical maps in some of these areas, and you just go, yeah, okay, <laughs> I can see why it's not going to happen. Yeah, I can see why you need a helicopter. So, so uh, and we use a helicopter in some headlands where I mean, you know, risk to life and limb was actually a, a, a heavy consideration. Yeah. I, I want to give Mary a chance to um, yeah, respond I kinda, to that, too. I flubbed that slide a little bit because I left out some important pieces of the puzzle. Um, as I said, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife claims that the burrowing owls will quit visiting the Fairlawns if, they, if, if the mice are gone. But critics of this plan point out that it's much more likely that they'll that turn, they, they're going to need more question. Exactly. No, no, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, but I was just, the are, way you characterize it, it was kind of throwing out all island rat eradication projects. And I'd say just well, be a little careful there, there because there's there, nothing good about rats on islands. Excuse me. Excuse me. There are very detailed critiques of other similar projects. And 
in this case and in many others, there's no after the project monitoring so that there's very little information about the unintended targets. But in one place in Alaska, uh, they, there was an after the fact monitoring. And I don't remember the numbers anymore, but several hundred bald Bulls. eagles were, 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 were killed and other animals. So there, in this case, there wasn't even a plan to count the dead animals so that we would learn from the experience. And rarely there are such after the fact studies. And when there are, we know that bad things happen. Okay, yes. can we just, I just want to make sure, you can continue this conversation, I think, but I want to make sure there, if anybody else has a question because we just have five minutes left or so. Well, yes. Sort of switching gears, um, and I wanted to ask uh, Lisa, the report was mostly, uh, was obviously uh, herbicide use on private land. Um, can you sort of talk about the difference between how private and public land is managed in Oregon? Because I've, I've heard that there's a difference between the management systems for those kind of timber practices, but I'm, I need it to be more clear in my head. When you say public land, you mean state or federal? Um, federal. So, um, so currently, although there might be some changes afoot, uh, there's no aerial spray in, on a federal forest, nor are herbicides used for forest management. That's the important word. There can be ground sprays for invasives, invasive weeds, but not for forest management. Um, there are federal forests that are clear cut. I just want. I I just meant. Do you does that definition include clear cuts? I think it does. Yes. Just one possible clarification. You said in the last twenty years, you may know, and at but in the mid nineties, the Mountain National Forest, and there may have been others. They did aerial spraying of BT to deal with the spruce budworm. Um, I don't know if there were other forests. I think it was during the time that the forest did have a ban on pesticide use, federal forests. And I think that that EIS still stands, although I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But they, there are exceptions occasionally. I think that was done as an exception. Well, I'm not an expert. Yeah. But I do know that when they sprayed a BT in Oregon for uh, the gypsy moth, they said it was an organic treatment. However, under the new rulings for the EPA, uh, biological pesticides that are discharged over the surface of water or around water for the purpose of at least controlling aquatic pests do have to fall under a specific pesticide use plan, which they didn't use to the whole, they're biological, we don't have to worry about it. That persisted until a, a lawsuit actually a couple of years ago when the EPA issued new rulings last year. Okay. Very good. So. Yeah. Great, other questions? <coughs> I'll have a comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, we've been talking about management of lands, and uh, in the previous session upstairs in the ballroom, a comment was made by one of the panelists that there used to be grants available to do manual removal of invasive species, if you notice that, and that now um, that is own, grants are only made if there are herbicides also being applied. And I wanted to bring this up again, especially with this group here, because this is a serious change in policy. It's discouraging any of the efforts we've been talking about today about alternative management of whether it's a lawn or a landscape or a forest or whatever. And also uh, in the research Beyond Toxics has done the lottery dollars that Oregonians are thinking are going either to educational purposes or to salmon restoration, those lottery dollars going to salmon restoration, over $1.5 million are going specifically for herbicide pro projects. In, in salmon restoration? Mm -hmm. Or what's said to be salmon yeah, restoration. So we've mapped some of those using GIS mapping. We found that lottery dollars were being given 
to um, a watershed group to go on private timber property, in this case it was Weyerhaeuser, to <coughs> spray for, I think it was um, false brome, nowhere near a salmon stream. So I just want to alert people that this is another area we can work on, that public dollars be so spent is appropriately. That? You mentioned that's OWEB, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Yeah, the person there, upstairs mentioned that. Oh, right. they did, yeah. Well, are there other um, agencies that are that have that same rule? Do you know? Well, OWEB gets a lot of dollars, and, and Allison probably knows more than I do, from Oregon Department of Agriculture, which is, uh, there's federal funds and state funds, and lottery dollars. It's well, actually, OWEB gets its money directly from 7.5% of lottery funds. Right. Yeah. That's what they're doing. <laughs> oh, so it's just yeah. lottery funds, okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. just our way. some federal funds, the, you know, salmon recovery funds for, through the federal government. But that's that's just a couple, that 100,000 versus, you know, probably 20 to 30 million a year for lottery funds. So I think Oregonians should bring this up, that yeah. lottery so dollars exactly. are going for Do you know why projects. they made that policy change? Did they, was there a, a discussion of that? No, it was just mentioned, and I'm actually shocked because we brought this up at the state legislature, and I, I think it's it's anti you should anticipate it because if you realize how powerful these chemical companies are, and the, the reality is is that you 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 know you, people have allowed species you know vegetation I'm talking mostly about vegetation now, but to be declared unwanted, and then they say well we'll go pick it well you know how long that's going to last, basically. And they want to get, they want to use herbicides. They want, you know, there is a huge lobby to do this. And one of the things that has disturbed me, and, and you know, I have, I, you know, my experience in Washington State is perhaps sort of, you know, skewed my thinking. But for instance, with Carboro, which they used in 1960, they determined the concentration of Carboro this was the aquaculture industry, as to how many crab it would kill. So when they would test the concentration, it could only kill a certain amount of crab. And there are people who think that actually this whole thing about getting rid of, you know, the ghost shrimp was really to get rid of other predators for, of the oysters by the aquaculture industry. So you have an industry in Washington State that determines all of these projects and the people are intimidated from really questioning it because they feel they believe all the you know all the information about how much how important the aquaculture industry is to the economy. And you've got the same thing in Oregon with the timber industry. You know, entire yeah, I mean, that are dependent on the timber act. So okay, we got a couple more. Time. You want to answer, and then there was a couple of questions back here. Yeah, and we, we need to go to dinner, but we have a couple minutes. I just, stick around. I just know to follow up on that conversation. I know I've talked to a number of folks from watershed councils and soil and water conservation districts that have invested a lot of time and money and volunteer effort into, um, you know, riparian planting projects, for instance, to try and stabilize the stream bank and provide native vegetation yeah. to cool the stream and filter pollutants. And I think. Folks have found over time that when um, there's not uh, enough diligence in terms of weed control through volunteers or personnel, that these projects fail. And then you have wasted money and time and you, you still don't have the benefits to the watershed health. And so I think um, some people have started using herbicides because they want these projects to actually last. And you certainly pointed out that Sometimes they still don't, but I imagine that's the motivation behind it. So I think yes. it would be really powerful to be able to share examples of what works in terms of a watershed restoration project and riparian planting that doesn't use herbicides and try and make that the standard. How, but sense. that's not what I said. We, the speaker upstairs said that projects will not be funded if there's any manual component. I didn't say uh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. I think it's if there are herbicides used. They said they must, they must include they the must use of pesticides. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's only manual, right. it cannot be funded. Right. That's right. what I just said. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is why so I'm, not, I'm guessing just their just motivation say. was to yeah. ensure that those projects are successful. Yeah. And so okay. I think showing, yeah. showing that that's possible without herbicide would be important to change that policy. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, there are two other questions. My question and is, is Oh, okay. I'm not. Go just ahead. Comment, but I think what Kevin said there, you're, you're correct. And because I don't, I don't have his counterpart on the other side of the river. And that when you do apply with some of these places, like you said, it's, they're skeptical whether they'll work. The problem that I have with that is that that's one of the ways you find out if it'll work. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So that, I think that's where you come in as an organization and say, like, we want these funds because it does not last if you start with Kevin. Right. Right. Dandelions are the one. They would be gone if if dandelions were killed by herbicides. We would not have them because God knows we spent enough money on (laughs) trying to kill them. And the the example from the city of Boulder shows it can be done. Right. And how many years have they been doing it? A lot of years. Okay, one last question, and then we'll go to Dan. I have a comment to share with everything that's going on. So Lisa knows me, and and, I'm one of my best beehives at her house right now, so um, in Eugene, and the struggle that we're having, I've called her numerous times on things happening. The park next to my um, yard, um, I put 25 native Oregon trees in there five years ago. They're doing awesome because the city has left them alone, except when they put in a salmon restoration area, they dumped rocks numerous times and then drove bulldozers back and forth throughout the whole summer and compacted to the soil so that there's nothing left at all in the soil for natural life. Now they only have to mow it twice a year instead of three times because it's so darn compacted, except for my barrier of my trees, I couldn't go past that. So, um, but it is just ridiculous and just one of my buddies, city buddies that I'm so difficult with, um, is gonna retire in one year, I'm really excited, but I just, <laughs> just saw him last week and they're gonna put in this nice cleanup area now to catch the um, any kind of spills that are coming down the roadway um, before it gets to the river. So I said, I'm so excited about that, and I'm so excited that there's pesticide-free parks now. He goes, oh no, they're neo nicky something, and uh, you know, but we're gonna try to practice those things. But uh, and I go, oh, so you're gonna do the cleanup here before it gets to through the middle of the park here, but then your salmon restoration area, oh no, I can still use pesticides in that salmon restoration area that flows into the river. So this really difficult in my yard, he just keeps telling me it's not my yard, so mind my own beeswax and don't say anything. But I say, Lisa, hell, because I'm just little old hey. beekeeper gardener and I see them out there doing these things that it just make no sense with the little signs that are ankle height. Yeah, yeah. So this really is happening. This was just two weeks ago. And the guys that used to come and dig, and I dig every year in that park and give my blood, sweat, and tears to haul out you know, ivy and dig some blackberries so that they won't spray and they still come back and tell me when I went just two weeks ago and, and yeah. made a phone call and put in paperwork to try to put in a pollinator garden. They said, five years ago you asked to put in an organic garden. We're still at that. You have to sit through an hour and a half long PowerPoint presentation of the SIP DIP program to try to put it on the possibly we may do this in the next 10 years as a good idea. Yeah. Instead of taking my volunteer energy and everybody else's to make these pollinator gardens into a happy soil area to try to make that land healthy again, and that's what they come back at saying. And um, so and it's did, so- Didn't you <coughs> tell me though that it was a prophylactic, they were using the pesticides to do prophylactic removal of invasive species or something of that sort? The only thing they were saying was they were gonna be were using this something that there, that there could be possibly a bad invasive um, pesticide, you know, invasive, invasive species in that sand restoration area that they created themselves so they had to spray so that it wouldn't show up. But when I asked four people down there, please come down and identify what this plant is, yeah. nobody could show me what it was, and nobody could even know. tell me what it looked like. <laughs> and I have asked every know. single time of all these people what this even looks like, and so I can come and dig it myself when it is down to ankle deep water or no water at all. Can we come and take a walk in this area? Oh, no, 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 no. We can't do that. So it's so frustrating. Well, and what I don't understand is like all the stream rest- restoration projects I've volunteered for, mm-hmm. the whole point was adding uh, green material to shade mm-hmm. the stream mm-hmm. and filter the water. So I'm confused yeah, why they're I'm really surprised just what the heck they're doing. Yeah, I know. It really is. They put in some natives so that we couldn't do anything with even go down to try to try to remove the things that they can't identify, but they put in their own things and now they're spraying just there in their little zone of where they're maintaining, so I can't go down there. And so it's really confusing. Yeah. Sounds you know. like they're 
Yeah, they don't yeah. sell what they're growing. And my guess is they were hand digging by volunteering also. They changed them from digging up the blackberries to just clipping them. And then they decide, well, since the clipping, they came back, oh, now we have to spray. Yeah, we better Because they were able to, spray, to dig two years ago. Last year they were clipping, and this year they're spraying. So in, I just want to thank our panelists, both for their presentations, but also for the great contributions. Yeah, before you go to dinner, if you need reading material, I would yeah, the community yeah, engagement it. guide or the guidelines for equal to the sound of mosquito yeah. management. Yeah. Don't leave without them. <laughs> forever. Regret it forever. <laughs>